Hi folks, it's good to be with you. Love to everybody out there. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord be with you. I'm making a video uh, on the historical reliability of the Gospels. This article that I'm uh, referring to is by Probe Ministries, so they get the credit for the information that I'm about to read. It's good to be with you. Don't forget my website, jasonbirdspreacher.com. Don't forget you can get my books on Amazon. Um, Under the Radar, The Life of Sam Harris, uh, The Corruption of the Quran, 10 Reasons Why the Quran is Not the Word of God, uh, that's a little booklet, and uh, there's lots of other little books and that I've edited or write, written, so please go to Amazon, and you can get me on Facebook and Twitter, it's good to be with you, and love to everybody out there, so let's, without further ado, go to the historical reliability of the Gospels, and get into into this. It says, Skeptics have criticized the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, as being legendary in nature rather than historical. They point to alleged contradictions between Mark, Luke and John, and they also maintain Gospels were written centuries after the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. So, the first challenge to address is how to account for the differences among the four Gospels. They are each different in nature, content and facts they include or exclude. The reason for the variations is that each author wrote to a different audience from his own unique perspective. Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience to prove to them that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. That's why Messiah, Matthew includes many of the teachings of Christ and makes numerous references to the Old Testament prophecies. Mark wrote to a Greek or Gentile audience to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. Therefore he makes his case by focusing on the events of Christ's life. His gospel moves very quickly, quickly from one event to another, demonstrating Christ's lordship over all creation. Luke wrote to give an accurate historical account of Jesus' life, and John wrote after reflecting on his encounter with Christ for many years. With that insight, near the end of his life, John sat down and wrote most theological of all the gospels. We would expect some differences between four independent accounts. If they were identical, we would suspect the writers of collaboration with one another because of their differences. The four Gospels actually give us a fuller and richer picture, fuller, richer picture of, Christ, of Jesus. So let's just meditate on that for a, a moment. When you hear uh, Bible critics, the atheist or uh, scholars like Bart Ehrman and they begin to pull apart the Gospels or Muslims when they're debating in Hyde Park and they begin to pull apart the Gospels and say there's a contradiction there, there's a contradiction here in the Gospels I think it is right to say that very often they fail to appreciate the motive of each writer the structure of each Gospel the cultural context of each Gospel and for example, you can get into problems when you say there are contradictions between the Gospels when it comes to time. Because sometimes uh, the Gospels refer to Roman time or, and sometimes to Jewish time. And so people say, oh, there's a contradiction with the time. But wait a minute, you're talking, you're not realizing that one is using Roman time and the other is using, using Jewish time. Okay? Um, and then. And, and, and because you're not looking at how each gospel has been structured, you're failing to, to appreciate uh, that when you try to collate them together, they're not, they're not done uh, as we would expect in a, in a modern biography. We've got to look at these from a first century point of view, how they are, how they are put together by each writer. Because, like he said, um, Matthew chunks a lot of the teaching of the Lord Jesus. Mark is very quick in, 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 his, in, in, in the uh, scenes of the Lord Jesus. And uh, I think Luke, there's a lot more parables of the Lord Jesus. And in John, there's a lot more of the personal, private teaching and prayer of the Lord Jesus. For example, in John 17. So without you, with, unless you 
truly consider each gospel, the way it's been put together, you're going to get into a mess when you try to collate them all together and say there's contradictions. When there aren't contradictions, really, it's just you not understanding the structure of each gospel. If you go on to uh, Third Millennium Ministries, there's a wonderful course on the Gospels that actually goes into full detail on this issue. That's Third Millennium Ministries, and uh, the course on the Gospels is a wonderful course giving you all what I've just told you over like, I think, four to eight hours of study. Wonderful, wonderful course. So it goes on, let me give you an example. Imagine if four people wrote a biography on your life, your son, your father, a co-worker and a good friend. They would each focus on different aspects of life and write from a unique perspective. One would be writing about you as a parent, another as a child growing up, one as a professional and one as a peer. Each may include different stories or see the same event from different angle, but the differences would not mean they are in error. When we put all four accounts together, we would get a richer picture of your life and character. That is what is taking place in the Gospels. So we acknowledge the differences do not necessarily mean errors. Skeptics have made allegations of errors for centuries, yet the vast majority of charges have been answered. New Testament scholar Dr. Craig Blomberg writes, Despite two centuries of skeptical onslaught, it is fair to say that all the alleged inconsistencies among the Gospels have received at least plausible resolution. Another scholar, Murray Harris, emphasised, even then, the presence of discrepancies in circumstantial detail is no proof that the central fact is an historical. The four Gospels give us a complementary, not a contradictory account. Now, Murray Harris, I do not agree with Murray Harris here. Re listen to what he says. Even then, the presence of discrepancies in the circumstantial detail is no proof that the central fact is unhistorical. I disagree with that. That is a, a comment that I completely disagree with. He's saying that there can be minor faults within the Gospels, but the big facts are correct. So therefore there's no issue. There is an issue because that common attacks inerrancy that is to say the scriptures are fully inerrant without error the scriptures have no error there are no minor discrepancies the scriptures are pure perfect because they are the word of god so i disagree with that comment date of the new testament writings internal evidence jesus ministry was from AD 70 to 30, noted New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce gives strong evidence that the New Testament was completed by 100. Most writings of the New Testament works were completed 20 to 40 years before this. The Gospels are dated traditionally as follows. Mark is believed to be the first Gospel written about AD 60. Matthew and Luke follow and are written between 60 to 70. John is the final Gospel written between AD 90 to 100. Internal evidence supports these early dates. Uh, just, just on a, on a, on a, off the cuff mark. The early church fathers thought that Matthew was the earliest. Just a little thought. Internal evidence supports these early dates for several reasons. The first three gospels prophesied the fall of Jerusalem temple, which occurred 70 A.D. However, the fulfillment is not mentioned. It is strange that these three Gospels predict this major event, but do not record it happening. Why do they not mention such an important prophetic milestone? The most plausible explanation is that it had not yet occurred at the time Matthew, Mark, Luke and were written. In the book of Acts, the temple plays a central role in the nation of Israel. Luke writes as if the temple is an important part of Jewish life. He also ends Acts on a strange note. Paul living under house arrest. It is strange that Luke does not record the death of his two chief characters, Peter and Paul. The most plausible reason for this is that Luke finishes writing uh, 
Acts before Peter and Paul's martyrdom in AD 64. A significant point to highlight is that the Gospel of Luke precedes Acts. Further, supported the traditional dating of AD 60, further most scholars agree Mark precedes Luke, Mark, making Mark's Gospel even earlier. I think these are really, really personally good points that that any scholar tried to answer these and, and come up with replies uh, are really not dealing with the facts that are being made put here which are really good. Finally the majority of New Testament scholars believe that Paul's epistles, epistles are written from AD 40 to 60. Paul's outline of the life of Jesus matches that of the Gospels. 1 Corinthians is one of the least disputed books regarding its dating and Pauline authorship. In chapter 15, Paul summarizes the gospel, reinforces the premise that this is the same gospel preached by the apostles. Even more compelling is that Paul quotes from Luke 1 Tim in 1 Timothy 5.18, showing us that Luke's gospel was indeed completed in Paul's lifetime. This would move up the time of the completion of Luke's gospel along with Mark and Matthew. Now I agree with this, I think this is solid, but from a scholarly point of view, uh, a lot of scholars would dispute that 1 Timothy is of Paul. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, um, when you, the, the early church father's testimony to Pauline epistles is, is solid. And uh, I think any scholar who would disagree with that really isn't worth the salt as a scholar. Uh, and also, he mentioned 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we have that's one of the earliest sources, the first few verses of the historical Jesus, because it tells us uh, the basic structure of what the early church believed. Um, so, next, the dead of the Gospels' external evidence. Were the Gospels written by eyewitnesses? Fortunately, New Testament scholars have an enormous amount of ancient manuscript evidence. The documentary evidence of the New Testament far surpass any other work of its time. We have over 5,000 manuscripts and many are dated within a few years of their authors' lives. Here are some key documents. An important manuscript in the Chester Beatty Papyri. It contains most of the New Testament writings and is dated about 250 AD. The Bodmer papyri contains most of John and dates at AD 200. Another is the Rylands papyri that was found in Egypt that contains a fragment of John and dates to AD 130. From this fragment we conclude that John was completed well before AD 130 because not only did the gospel have to be written, it had to be hand copied and makes its way down from Greece to Egypt. Since the vast majority of scholars agree that John is the last gospel written, we can affirm the first century date uh, along with other three great assurances. So I just want to comment on this. So what we find here in the Chester of BT uh, papyri and the Bodmore Papyri, which contains most of John, days to 200, is that the New Testament is a first century document because these would have had to have been copied and these copies spread. So, as, as you calculate the spreading of the copies, you get back to 100 AD, you get back to the first century. A final piece of evidence comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Cave 7. John Callahan discovered a fragment of the Gospel of Mark and dated to have been written about AD 50. He also discovered fragments of Acts and other epistles and dated them to have been written slightly after AD 50. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a lot of political battling with the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think there are possibly, are possible... Uh, allusions to various New Testament Gospels but it's highly contested because uh, 
a lot of scholars are so anti-Christian that they try to contest this but it's definitely evidence worth looking at and I would look, like to go into more detail concerning Jose Callahan on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Another line of evidence in the writings of Church Fathers Clement of Rome sent a letter to the Corinthian Church in AD 95 in which he quoted from Gospels and other portions of the New Testament. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, wrote a letter before his martyrdom in Rome in AD 115 quoting all the Gospels and other New Testament letters. Polycarp wrote to the Philippians in AD 120 and quoted the Gospels and New Testament letters and Justin Martyr 150 quotes John 3. Church fathers of the early 2nd century were familiar with the Apostles' writing and quoted them as inspired scripture. Early dating is important for two reasons. The closer historical the record is to the date of the event, the more likely the record is accurate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think you've got to be careful there. I mean, this is kind of popular apologetics. Just because a source is early does not necessarily mean it's the most accurate. But the Gospels are the most early, but on top of that, they show a veracity in the historical reliability. So not only does a source have to be early to be credible, it also has to be a good source. And I think the writer here uh, should have put that in. And the Gospels are good source for historical data. Reliable, how reliable was oral tradition? Pre previously, defending the early date in the Gospels, despite the early dating, there is a time gap of several years between the ascension of Jesus and the writing of the Gospels. There is a period during which the Gospel accounts were committed to memory by the disciples and transmitted orally. The question is, we mu the question we must answer is, was the oral tradition memorized and passed on accurately? Skeptics assert that memory and oral tradition cannot accurately prevent, prevent, pre preserve accounts from person to person for many years. The evidence shows that in oral cultures where memory has been trained from generations, oral memory can accurately preserve and pass on large amounts of information. Deuteronomy 6.4.9 reveals to us how important oral instruction and memory of divine teaching was stressed in Jewish culture. It is well known the fact that the rabbis had the Old Testament and much of the oral law committed to memory. The Jews placed a high value on memorizing whatever writing reflected inspired scripture and the wisdom of God. I studied under Greek professor who had the Gospels memorized word perfect. In a culture where this was practiced, memorization skills were far advanced compared to ours today. New Testament scholar Darrell Bloch Bock, states that the Jewish culture was a culture of memory. <coughs> uh, Riser presents six key reasons why oral tradition accurately preserves Jesus' teachings. First, Jesus used the Old Testament prophets practice of proclaiming the word of God which demanded accurate preservation of inspired teaching. Second, Jesus presented presentation of himself as Messiah would reinforce among his followers the need to preserve his words accurately. Third, 90% of Jesus' teachings and sayings use mnemonic methods similar to those used in Hebrew poetry. Fourth, Jesus trained his disciples to teach his lessons even while he was on earth. Fifth, Jewish boys were educated until they were 12, so the disciples likely knew how to read and write. Finally, just as Jewish and Greek teachers gathered disciples, Jesus gathered and trained his to carry on after his death. When one studies the teaching of Jesus, one realizes that his teaching and illustrations are easy to memorize. People throughout the world recognize immediately the story of the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son and the Lord's Prayer. We also know that the Church preserved the teachings of Christ in the form of hymns which were like easy to memorize. Paul's summary of the Gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 is a good example of this.
We are confident then that the oral tradition accurately preserved the teachings and the events of Jesus' life till they were written down just a few years later. Now, um, I want to take issue with this issue about oral tradition. Uh, because I think it's a, a leftover from Rudolf Bultmann and the form critics and people who who go beyond that right back into the uh, uh, 19th century and to people like uh, Gunkel uh, and Scandinavian scholars who, who kind of had these very similar ideas to uh, Rudolf Bultmann and basically the idea is that that um, there would be groups in a society that develop the oral tradition after a certain historical event. This is Boltman. So Boltman had the idea, Boltman was a great scholar I don't agree with him. He was not evangelical. He was not orthodox. But he was a he was a great scholar in terms of his output of what he wrote, uh, not necessarily his quality. And he wrote. Uh, he, he had this idea that culture um, that there were groups that preserved the culture of their group by oral tradition. And so therefore, when an event took place, it, the oral tradition of the group would morph and change over time. And that was the basic idea of Boltman. So therefore, the historical Jesus was not really historical. It was basically the community's development of oral tradition. You see. And this, this kind of idea infected scholarship like a like a cancer uh, in the early mid, mid uh, sorry in the mid 20th century even before that long before that before even Boltman kind of uh, made them popular but Boltman made them popular and in the mid 20th century they were like a cancer that that permeated every every sphere of academia and so what that means is when evangelicals go to university to get their degrees and to get their PhDs, they have to interact with these Boltman scholars, even the scholars today that are not Boltman scholars are still infected with the Boltman ideologies and the Boltman methodologies, you see. And so this article is evangelical but it's in that atmosphere, still in that atmosphere. And what does that mean? Well, he's trying to defend the veracity of the Gospels, that they're historically reliable, because they're based on oral tradition. <coughs> and saying that, um, alright, there's been a bit of time since the event of Jesus' ascension, but oral tradition is accurate and look at the specifics of Jewish oral tradition and culture. The problem with that is, is that oral tradition is not inspired. And so oral tradition can be, um, it, it can be, uh, what can I say, it, it can have mistakes in it. It's not perfect. So you still open yourself up to the charge that, okay, it might be accurate to a certain extent, but your oral tradition is not perfect, it's human, so there could be mistakes in it, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's fully accurate. So, yes, I agree that oral tradition is, <coughs> is um, helpful, it's good that they did preserve it, um, but I think this argument of the importance of oral tradition it, it comes from um, the residue or the what can I say the the dregs of the Boltman era um, 
I mean, then I would take issue with the importance of oral tradition. Yes, oral tradition was important, no doubt about it. Yes, there were certain ways of memorization, such as uh, Paul's statement in Philippians 2. He thought it not robbery to be equal with, equal with God. That is, is, you know, there are certain hymns that Paul used, uh, certain creeds that Paul used for memorization. Our Lord used ways of memorization. So there's no doubt away, no doubt about that, of the importance of oral tradition. But I think that a lot of scholarship today, because of because of Boltman's influence, <clears throat> evangelicals have have latched onto it or been influenced it unwittingly. But if you think about it, in Jewish culture, Paul. Uh, uh, Moses was told to write down there was always a written culture right at the beginning and if you look at um, you look at the Hittites you look at uh, the Babylonians uh, for example the Babylonians had massive libraries uh, the Syrians the Hittites the Egyptians they all had a written culture and here's the key the priestly class specifically felt they were custodians of their religious te religious uh, teaching and so therefore had to have religious text and they were the custodians of these religious texts. So, what's my point? My point is this, is that beware of using the defense of oral tradition. It, is, it can be helpful but undergird it with the fact that ancient cultures were also written cultures which is an anathema to modern scholarship today because they don't agree with that statement that I've made but if you go and read Josephus uh, the history of the Jews uh, if, you, if you go and read his uh, historical works on the history of the Jews and also in his his historical method against called against Appion. It'll verify that I'm correct. If you even go and study the um, you go and study the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and the scholarship behind the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there was a, a there was a, a solid written culture, even among the Essenes in the mountains and in Judea and in around Galilee there were cultures of Essenes like groups of kind of monk kind of people and they were a written culture as well as an oral culture and this is often missed by modern scholarship today because they if, if that is the case <coughs> it would strengthen the case for inerrancy of scripture and it would dismantle people like Bart Ehrman totally and utterly if that argument that I've just made from the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Josephus histor historical works etc, the Babylonian libraries etc, it would just dismantle people like Bart Ehrman and, and, and a lot of modern scholarship that that tries to paint the picture of the Gospels as oral tradition that has changed and is not perfectly accurate that's why you have what is called the synoptic problem. And really it's the modern scholars wanting to go underneath the Gospels to try and find the real Jesus. And that comes back because they believe that it's all old oral tradition that's changed and there's nothing fully accurate. We've got to get behind the oral tradition and get to the truth, you see. But if my argument's true, that if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the end scenes and how they were a, a written culture in the time of Jesus. If you look at the Babylonian libraries, if you look at the history of Judaism, uh, it, the history of ancient religions about the time uh, prior to the Lord Jesus, a few hundred years prior to the Lord Jesus, even a thousand years before our Lord Jesus. And if, I, if, if we can find that it's not only oral but a written culture, then it puts into question a lot of modern scholarship when they start to say the Gospels are just oral tradition that's been changed and we have to get behind the Gospels and therefore we invent what is called the synoptic Gospel uh, problem.
and so we come up with the cue and all the rest of it like that. So I think we'll leave it there. I think if you meditate on what I've said about written culture and about the Dead Sea Scrolls, I think Bart Ehrman is destroyed in all his books and his attacks upon the Bible. It's all been dismantled by that one statement I'm making by the issue of the Dead Sea Scrolls and that the Essenes were a written culture. Think about that. Bart Ehrman talks about that the Gospels have changed, that they're not written.